the Bar Association, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Lisa Darko. Um, we, of course, want to make sure you guys are getting all the educational um, information that you need. And I just want to thank uh, Judge Fairgrave and Judge Osser for taking the time today to provide updates and reports. Um, and thank you all for attending and please look out for future content. So with that, Judge Fairgrave, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, well, thanks very much, Paige. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking Paige and Lisa Darko um, and the Bar Association more broadly for providing the court with an opportunity to uh, update you know, members of the Bar Association uh, about what you know, Superior Court is doing at this point, what District Court's doing, and then you know, have an opportunity to, to answer some questions for you. Um, I meet on a regular basis with representatives of the bar through the, the monthly uh, Superior Court uh, Bench Bar Committee, and then uh, more recently, weekly, I've been meeting with the uh, Criminal Policy and Procedure Committee, which as the name indicates, is principally oriented toward you know, criminal you know, procedure and policy here in the county. But uh, I know that you know, those, there are limited members of those committees, and, and I know that they uh, publish minutes or, or communicate with the bar, but I think you know, this is a, a great opportunity really to talk with members of the bar a little bit and answer some of your questions. Uh, so Mariah, if you could start the PowerPoint, I appreciate that. Okay, go ahead and go to the first slide. All right, so what I'd like to do this morning is, is talk about courthouse operations a little bit. I know there's, there's concern about what's going on in the courthouse and the measures we're taking to make sure everybody is you know, safe, uh, or as safe as we can make it really, and, and what we're gonna be doing. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. Um, I wanna talk about what our plans are for recommencing jury trials you know, as of uh, Monday, July 6th. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, current uh, Superior Court operations, you know, both in the criminal realm and uh, in the civil realm. And then finally, I want to give you a little bit of an idea <clears throat> of what we're looking at in terms of our future operations. Uh, Mariah, go ahead. So if you haven't already, what I would invite you to do is go on our website, the Superior Court website. You can find that, you know, through the, the county website um, and take a look at uh, our general order 20-13 that came out last Friday the 19th. And uh, although much of that information that was in that, that particular order is the same, uh, there was some new information, you know, focusing uh, in particular on, on courthouse operations. And so first of all, we certainly are indicating anybody who's sick or been in quarantine is not gonna be allowed into the courthouse. Um, I can't tell you about, you know, questioning that will actually take place at the front door. Certainly anybody who's symptomatic is not gonna be allowed entry. I think we'll be working on that issue, what sort of questions are, are asked, and that's kind of an evolving situation. Um, we're requiring that staff and visitors wash their hands or use sanitizer, which is, is in the courthouse, and I'll, I'll track on that to, to see you know, how many you know, sanitizer stations we have. Um, frequently touched surfaces are being routinely cleaned. I can tell you that from my own personal observation there are uh, staff members who I see uh, on a regular basis who are uh, in the courthouse throughout the day, you know, cleaning, you know, like the, um, the hand holds on the stairs and the flat surfaces in the, um, the foyer area. So I can tell you that that, that sort of cleaning is taking place. Uh, again, social distancing measures are being strictly enforced to the greatest extent uh, practicable. This has been kind of a evolving thing for us um, if you've been in a courthouse recently, uh, you probably noticed that there are, there are, the signage has increased, there are marks on the floor, um, you know, for where people are going to stand, for instance, if they're outside the district court clerk's office or superior court clerk's office. So there certainly has been a lot more emphasis in that. The courtrooms, to the best of my knowledge, have now been uh, marked so that uh, where individuals can sit in the, in the gallery has been marked and the rest of the area has been taped off. So, um, so I think that's, that, that's a good thing, you know, in many regards. Uh, it's cutting down certainly on a number of individuals that can go into a particular courtroom, but I don't think we really have much option there. Um, Ryan, next slide, please. So our order goes on to indicate all persons in the courthouse are gonna be required to wear a mask while in the public areas. 
um, certainly, you know, this, our whole situation, this whole COVID-19 situation continues to be a changing situation. I put together this PowerPoint uh, yesterday uh, morning in anticipation of today. And of course, the governor, you know, has a new order that's out today requiring, you know, masks indoors and then masks outdoors uh, if a person can't socially distance is what I understand the general rules are. Our rules have a couple of exceptions, children under two years uh, or less, uh, kids under 12 years old, unless they're supervised by a caregiver, uh, anybody who has a physical disability that would prevent them from easily wearing or removing a face covering. Um, Mariah, let's go to the next slide. Anybody who, who's deaf and uses facial and mouth movements as part of communication or individuals uh, who communicate with a person who's deaf and uses facial or mouth movement as a part of communications. Any individual has been advised by a medical practitioner that wearing a face mask might pose a risk to their health. And then finally, any individual has trouble breathing, is unconscious or incapacitated or otherwise unable to remove the face covering. So I'll, I'll tell you that we there's an ongoing sort of discussion at this point about uh, the actions that, that judges are gonna take if an individual is uh, not wearing a mask. I think in the wake perhaps of the governor's order of yesterday, we're probably gonna have less of an issue there. I know that the wearing of masks has certainly political implications um, within uh, our society, uh, both in our county and, and beyond. Uh, but it's my hope that, that uh, with the governor's order, we're gonna see less of that. Um, but it's gonna be an individual judge's decision, I think based on the facts of a particular situation, what action he or she will take if an individual is not wearing a mask and uh, declines to put one on. Next slide, please. So in terms of recommencing jury trials uh, starting on July 6th, so the, you know, the Supreme Court had indicated in one of its first orders in, in the wake of uh, its initial set of orders in March that, you know, jury trials were canceled through July 6th, but they haven't changed, you know, that, that um, particular aspect of any of their orders in their subsequent orders that have come out. And so I think the implication is that, that you know, that can and probably need to start, you know, commencing jury trials, you know, after July 6th. And I think that's probably the intent, you know, of the Supreme Court. They've had an opportunity to extend that date if they wanted to, and they, they haven't in any of their subsequent, subsequent orders. So they formed a work group uh, to provide guidelines to the courts as to uh, resuming jury trials. Um, only last Thursday, actually, uh, June 18th, uh, the Supreme Court published uh, three different documents that they sent out to all the Superior Court judges. Um, I understand that uh, members of the bar have those. If you don't, I'm sure they're available on the uh, on the uh, the AOC website, or certainly I can forward them to the bar and you can distribute them. But um, there was a Supreme Court order and modification of jury proceedings. There was a resuming uh, jury trials in Washington, which is the, the report of the um, work group they put together. And finally, there was a uh, um, Washington State Court's uh, public health risk and recommendations that came out um, as well on that day. Um, before all of those documents came out, um, our Supreme, Superior Court had put together a, a work group of judges uh, and our, our administrator who were working on protocols that, that we plan on using to recommence jury trials. And certainly they've taken into account the information that came out in those three documents that came out last Thursday. In fact, uh, Judge Collier was a member of the work group that was putting together the series of recommendations. So the following are the, the recommendations by the committee that were adopted by the rest of the Superior Court judges in a meeting we had on Monday. Uh, Mariah, next slide. So in kind of a linear process here, after the readiness hearings, uh, which occur, criminal readiness hearings, which occur on Thursdays, and the first of which will be next Thursday on July 2nd, uh, the judge is gonna decide which case is gonna go forward and in which courtrooms. Now, at this point, there's a maximum of two Superior Court jury trials we're gonna be able to conduct a week. And the reason for that simply is that in order to enforce social distancing, um, basically we need a courtroom to present the trial in, and we need a second courtroom for each jury for them to take jury breaks and to deliberate in. We just, the, the jury deliberation rooms are not large enough to enforce social distancing. And so to, in order to have sufficient space, we have to have a larger area and that's what we're planning on doing. So candidly, that takes up four courtrooms, you know, for two jury trials, um, you know, going each week. 
Civil trials can go forward on a case-by-case -case basis uh, with criminal trials having priority. So let's say, for instance, we get to a readiness hearing on Thursday and we're done with that hearing and, and only one criminal trial has been called ready. Uh, in that situation, certainly, you know, we can go forward with a civil trial and uh, the parties will be notified at that point and, and we'll go forward. Jury selection for Superior Court cases is gonna occur out at the Clark County Fairgrounds to facilitate social distancing. So this is a discussion that, you know, kind of began early in the process. We looked at a number of, um, of potential options, but, uh, but in the end, in order to conduct a, you know, a, a voir dire, you know, with a, a panel of about 40, which is what we're looking at for an average trial, we needed a much larger venue to do that. And so uh, we contacted the fairgrounds and we, are, we have a contract with them through about the middle of October to provide us space there. Uh, hopefully you're gonna be working, our administrators are gonna be working on looking at some alternatives, you know, uh, for what's gonna happen after the middle of October. Additionally, we'll have quite a bit of experience, I think at that point, assuming that we're able to conduct jury trials between now and then. Um, there's gonna be remote viewing of jury selection uh, of, that's gonna occur out of the fairgrounds. We're not gonna be taking spectators out to the fairgrounds to watch the jury selection process. The jury selection process is gonna be recorded digitally and we're gonna be uh, streaming that either uh, onto a website or here into the courthouse. And we'll be announcing what, how we're gonna run that here in the next few days. Uh, we're gonna be recording the jury selection uh, using our JAVS recording system uh, when it takes place out at the fairground. Mariah, next slide, please. All right, a few things to think about here. Um, one thing I would just mention as far as these uh, jury trials are concerned, um, the amount of logistics involved um, is substantially greater than an average jury trial that we've experienced in the past. Uh, as a result, you know, you know, candidly, in the past, we wanted to certainly do everything we needed to do or could do prior to a trial beginning so we can uh, focus on the actual trial and presentation of evidence and uh, eventual argument and deliberation um, with as few, you know, outside aspects as possible. It's going to be even more important now for, for all aspects of the trial process that can be um, completed prior to the beginning of voir dire to be done. So pretrial motions need to take place by five o'clock on a Friday prior to the trial. This is, like I say, it's critical. You know, we, we just, you know, with, with everything that's going on, we really can't be stopping the proceedings to deal with a series of, of pretrial motions, certainly, you know, in-depth evidentiary motions that require a substantial amount of argument. As I mentioned, two courtrooms are going to use for each trial. Um, one trial is going to be taking place per floor. Um, and so the two courtrooms that are going to be used will be on the same floor. Our plan at this point is to have witnesses wait on another floor, and then they'll be called and they'll have to come up to that particular floor. Uh, there's going to be limited seating available for spectators in the courtroom. So if you can kind of visualize the courtroom, there, the jury box is not big enough to, to socially distance. So there are gonna be a limited number of jurors in each jury box, and then the remainder of the jurors are gonna be back in the gallery uh, on the side of the courtroom closest to the jury box. Um, they're gonna be taking up, frankly, most of the space uh, in the rest of the courtroom. There are gonna be very limited number of spots in each courtroom for actual spectators. Our plan, again, is to uh, live stream the proceedings uh, either to another courtroom using a large monitor or to a website. Brian, next slide, please. All right, as far as criminal operations are concerned, what we're up to right now, um, all of our courtrooms at this point have a capability to conduct and record remote hearings using Zoom. Um, that's only been the last couple of weeks we've been able to do that. Uh, we needed some hardware, um, a piece of hardware called a Polycom. Uh, we needed that hardware to be able to integrate Zoom with Jazz and uh, to be able to record those hearings into our recording system, which is Jazz and then also interface with the video booths that are over in the jail so that the courtrooms can conduct hearings involving um, criminal defendants who are currently in the jail. So we got that, um, that hardware recently. It's been installed in all the courtrooms and I think you know, the courtrooms or the courts have been you know, holding those hearings now. So the following criminal dockets are being conducted at this point. And, and before I begin that, uh, what we've done is as we began to um, reinstitute court operations and court hearings, we've begun to stand up hearings as, you know, we had demand for them. And not surprisingly, the first set of hearings we had to do, and we've been doing since the beginning of this, were the first appearance hearings and shortly thereafter arraignments. But 
Uh, we're doing first appearance hearings every morning at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, we have an arraignment docket at this point, uh, which occurs also in the morning, uh, Tuesday through Fridays at 9 a.m. We have currently change of plea dockets Monday through Thursday at 1.30. Um, the change of pleas are taking longer. Uh, in fact, all hearings are taking longer than they, they did prior to using you know, some sort of remote means. Um, but that's, I think, unfortunately, although we're getting more efficient with, frankly, each passing week, we still, you know, uh, we're not as efficient as we were in the past, and I'm not sure we ever will be, really. Um, we also have an out-of-custody criminal docket on Tuesday afternoons at 1.30. Uh, we're taking a maximum of four out-of-custody pleas uh, on that docket as well. Uh, page next slide. So what we're looking at in the future in terms of criminal dockets um, is that readiness dockets are going to begin again on um, Thursday, July 2nd. That's next Thursday. That's the week before the Monday when we can start having uh, trials again. We're not going to be doing any change of pleas at this point on the readiness docket. And that's simply because uh, with the increased time it takes for us to do each hearing, uh, we don't think we're going to be able to get through the readiness docket and do change of pleas. Uh, starting also on July 2nd, uh, the Thursday afternoon change of plea docket is going to be for out of custody cases only. And the reason for that is that um, the jail transport unit, which all of you are criminal practitioners knows, uh, historically has transported uh, criminal defendants over to the uh, courthouse here for hearings. They are running the video booths over in the jail and also still doing that function, you know, in the, the cases or in the hearings where we actually have criminal defendants brought over. Um, they've informed me that they cannot do both a readiness docket um, and a criminal docket or a change of plea docket at the same time. So out of custody change of plea docket doesn't impact them and so we're going to continue to do that. But for all you criminal practitioners, you know, with in custody matters, don't think you're going to be able to do a change of plea on a readiness docket. That's simply not going to occur, you know, even more reason, you know, to have these matters dealt with, you know, earlier in the week. There's going to be an in-custody uh, Friday afternoon criminal docket that's going to begin on Friday, uh, July 10th. Um, a maximum of four change of pleas on that docket as well. So at this point, as far as change of plea dockets are concerned, we've got, you know, as of July 10th, we're going to have a fair amount of capability. I think the numbers I looked at were about 40, the ability to do about 40 change of pleas a week. Right now, we're not seeing anywhere near that, that demand for change of pleas, either in custody or out of custody. Um, so we're going to monitor that, you know, as the demand increases, you know, we'll be adding uh, additional capability. Um, just from a historical perspective, you know, looking at the number of uh, felony cases we resolved last year, uh, we have to resolve about 50 to 60 cases a week just to hit our numbers, you know, in terms of what we resolved um, in 2019 in terms of overall criminal, you know, felony cases. And then finally, uh, there's going to be an afternoon drug court docket that's going to be again uh, starting here on July 10th. Uh, next slide. As far as civil operations are concerned, um, they were actually easier in some regards than some of our criminal uh, hearings to, to put together and start using. Motions dockets have been going on now for a few weeks. Uh, probate and guardianship docket has been going on for, I think, about two weeks now. In fact, I had it last Friday. Um, the numbers are a little bit light at this point, but we expect that they're going to increase. Um, planning is taking place right now for resumption of the unlawful detainer docket. We're mindful that there's probably going to be a wave of cases that are coming in once the, the governor's uh, um, prohibition day uh, on UD actions um, expires. So we're, we're looking at that. Judge Gregerson is working with, with uh, some attorneys who work in the UD sort of world uh, to you know, try to, to figure out the best way to address that, that wave when it comes in. Um, Family law dockets and trials are taking place at this point. They have been actually now for at least a month. Um, I know that uh, you know, Judge Vanderwood has had uh, a number of remote you know, trials. I think that Judge Lewis probably has as well. Um, and the hearings are taking place remotely. They, those have been successful to the best of my knowledge. I think it was easier in that sort of context to go to remote hearings than, as I mentioned, sometimes it is in the, um, the criminal arena. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as future operations, or what we're looking at at this point, um, I would just mention to you that, that we have eight courtrooms here, uh, Superior Court courtrooms in the main courthouse, G1, which is the arraignment courtroom or the pit, and then seven courtrooms that directly support each of the judges who's here. 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, jury trials are going to use at least four of the courtrooms on any trial day. And uh, just our criminal dockets on any given day uh, occupy uh, at least two of the courtrooms, certainly in the morning, every morning, you know, a couple of the courtrooms are taken up. Um, that leaves us really with two courtrooms, you know, during trial days uh, to handle everything else, you know, that we've got to handle here. So I'll just mention to you the lack of available courtrooms, you know, may have an impact on matters in the future. It may impact, you know, uh, criminal matters, but certainly I think it, it's going to impact, you know, civil matters. And I would say in particular, probably uh, it's going to have a negative impact on our ability to do special settings, especially once the volume picks up a little bit more. All right, next slide. All right, at this point, what questions do you have for me um, about anything I've talked about or about anything else that's on your mind? So I understand Mariah's gonna send them to me via the chat function, okay. The question is, my firm is working with the CCBA organized mass drive for the courthouse, more info coming. Okay, well, thank you very much. For that. Um, AOC is supposed to be providing masks to issue to uh, individuals coming into the courthouse. Um, and, but, you know, frankly, any help that anybody wants to offer in terms of that, um, you know, we certainly would appreciate that. I'm sorry, can you pop that next one up? Okay, there's a question with only two jury trials per week, will there be a calendar for which judges will be in jury trial? Um, at this point, I think the, so we publish um, a, a rotating seven week calendar and um, you can see on it which judges are set to do trials that particular week. We won't really know which judges are going to be going to trial until um, after the radius docket um, because um, if there are two or more criminal trials that are going out, those cases are going to take priority. If there's, you know, one or less, then we'll have some civil cases as well. I'm sorry, Maria, I wasn't able to read the other. So, next question, do attorneys go out to the fairgrounds for jury selection or is it done remotely? Uh, the answer is, uh, at this point, the attorneys are going out to the jury, uh, to the fairgrounds is my understanding, and social distancing is going to be enforced while they're out there. So will defense counsel and defendant be out at the fairgrounds during jury selection? The answer is yes. Um, we've worked with the jail. Uh, they are planning on taking in custody criminal defendants out to the court, uh, the fairgrounds for um, jury selection and social distancing is gonna be enforced during that. Should civil trials assume they're not going unless notified by the court on Thursday? Um, so my sense would be this, I would say to anybody who's got a civil trial, you know, stay in contact with the JA. Uh, the first thing they'll probably be able to tell you is the number of cases that are set for trial, criminal cases set for trial on a particular day. They also, as they get close to the readiness hearing, know, you know, pretty much have a pretty good idea where most of the cases are going. So I would definitely do that. And you definitely want to check with the, the JA late in the afternoon on Thursday or early Friday morning, because they'll know at that point which cases are going to trial. Will attorneys wear masks throughout trial? So I think the short answer on this is probably yes. Um, there's uh, some provision, I think, if, uh, if, an, if you can engage in social distancing and we're having problems hearing, um, you know, a judge uh, can have an individual, you know, take their mask off. Also, there's some issues about uh, the Sixth Amendment right of confrontation when a witness is testifying so that um, the jurors can see the, uh, the person's face uh, as part of their credibility determination function. So there are going to be some situations where a person might not have a mask, but the default is going to be masks on. All right. I understand there are any questions. Um, uh, judge, um, yes, there was one more that I received. Um, this is, does the 5 p.m. pretrial motion deadline apply to juvenile matters as well? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, certainly we want to, well, okay. So there aren't 
you know, as many matters or many issues, certainly in a juvenile sort of realm there because it's all bench trials, but, you know, it's, unless it's, you know, an emergency or unless, you know, this legal issue popped up, you know, during your, your weekend preparation, we really ought to be resolving pretty much, you know, all of our, certainly our detailed or complicated motions, you know, prior to the day of trial. Uh, and there, there are a series of reasons for that, but it just really increases, increases efficiency. So I think, although we were, we were looking specifically at jury trials, I think you ought to use that as a good guideline for any trials. Thank you. Well, thank you, Judge. Um, if there's any additional questions, um, if you just wanna email me or Lisa Darko and we can try to get those answered, we're also gonna be coordinating additional updates. I'm, I'm certain that Superior Court will um, have additional updates as we start to implement these new changes. And so we'll make sure to coordinate that and, and get that information out to you. Um, as far as the mask drive, uh, that is Laura Nelson's firm that is coordinating that. And so you can email her at lnelson at samuelslaw.com. So thank you so much for that. And thank you, Your Honor, for um, providing that information today. We're gonna go ahead and go with um, Judge Osler. If she is on, if you want to unmute Judge Osler. Mariah is. Judge Osler on, oh, okay. Um, well, we're not seeing her quite yet. So if maybe we wanna take a couple of minutes um, and wait for Judge Osler to join us. It's just after um, 11.30. So. And thank you, Judge, for your kind words about um, the Bar Association. We really wanna do what we can to help our members and um, the attorneys in our community navigate this so um we appreciate you know your time and effort in helping us coordinate this it's it's very confusing but um we'll, we'll make it through <laughs> um Ms. Pratt, what i did want to say to everybody since we've got a couple minutes is that i wanted to thank uh, the members of the bar association for you know your hard work and flexibility you know during this time. Um, I know it's, you know, change fatigue is a, a concept that we talk about here in the courthouse in terms of the fact that we are adopting new procedures almost on a weekly basis, you know, as we, you know, adopt both new hardware and software and, and uh, more efficient and effective ways of doing things. I'd like to say that's going to change, but um, I, I don't think it's going to change really <laughs> for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to predict what's going to occur. Everybody's reading the news. Everybody knows that, that numbers of cases, unfortunately, are going up. Um, and I think that's more indication that the social distancing that we're experiencing right now is, is not going to end anytime soon. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the attorneys I've worked with have shown a tremendous amount of flexibility, um, have effectively adopted, you know, the ability to engage in remote hearings and you know are, are working around a lot of the obstacles that we see and so i wanted to thank all of you for, for your hard work and effort in that uh, regard uh, it certainly makes our jobs easier if you have any recommendations for uh, things that you think that you know we should do or ways we can um, more effectively address a lot of the issues that we're facing uh, i'd be happy to hear them uh, i know the other judges would as well so you know please feel free to uh, um, provide that information you know to us Judge, another um, a, another uh, question came in while we were sitting here. If you if you don't mind, um, for the family law dockets, if we find that we are appearing before multiple commissioners in one day docket time, do you want us to notify the court that we have other matters at the same time, or just opposing counsel? My concern is that we won't be on a Zoom call, and the court may dismiss our motion because we are not present due to being present on a different call. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the, the problems that we're, we're finding is that, um, to the best of my knowledge, you can't be on multiple, you know, Zoom hearings at the same time. 
Uh, so definitely, um, what I would suggest is if you are required, you know, on multiple dockets at the same time, certainly if you're a family law practitioner, you could be on multiple dockets in the same morning. I would certainly, you know, notify the JAs and let the JA know that you're, you know, you're needed in various places at the same time. And, um, you know, that way, you know, the JA can let the judge know and the judge will recognize that, you know, you're, you know, if you're on another docket, and you plan on being on a docket at the beginning of the docket, perhaps your, your matter needs to be called at a later time on the other docket. But I think it usually works better if, you know, more information seems to work better than less. And certainly if you could, you know, notify the, the judges you're going to be in front of or commissioners that you're going to be on multiple dockets and you'll be there as soon as you can. I think that's helpful for, uh, for all of us, rather. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Judge Osler, have you been able to join us yet? Well, we will um, we'll keep it open for a couple more minutes. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to share in your chat. So I see a I see another question here. What volume of civil bench trials does the bench think it's going to be able to handle? You know, this is one of those those very difficult to answer questions. Um, and the short answer is I just I don't know, and I don't think the other judges know either. Um, what I think we're expecting to happen is the volume of criminal matters to increase um, as time goes on. And the the problem we're facing is that you know pretty much. Every hearing that we do, whether it's civil or criminal, takes longer than the hearings we historically have done. And our resources in terms of our amount of courtrooms, our amount of, you know, uh, judicial officers and support staff was structured to handle the volume that we had, you know, before COVID-19, you know, occurred and um, at the speed with which we were able to handle those matters in the past. Now, we, although the volume is down now, um, we fully expect that the volume is going to increase in the future. We know we have a big backlog of criminal matters that are going to need to be resolved. So, you know, as all, all of us know, criminal matters take priority over most civil matters. And, um, you know, so, you know, with all that as a backdrop, it's a little, it's hard for me to tell at this point. I would say if you're a civil practitioner, certainly just stay in contact with the judicial assistant for the judge you're with, uh, so you can kind of get a picture of what's going on there. But you know, I, I'm concerned uh, at this point um, about, you know, our ability to, you know, what our ability is going to be, frankly, to do a lot of civil work. Uh, we have the ability to do it now and it's been going on. Um, but, you know, it's, I think as time's going on, we can see an increase in the volume of, of criminal work. And like I say, the matters just take longer. And so, you know, I, I'd say stay tuned. I just, I don't have a strong or solid answer for you right now. So Judge, we have one more question. Um, have you seen a, some kind of consistency amongst the judges about rescheduling civil cases set for the next trial year if the parties are in agreement? Is that just department by department or is there been any discussion? Um, you know, we don't have a uniform sort of approach, you know, uh, as far as that's concerned at this point. Uh, certainly I've, I've been very flexible, you know, if the parties are coming in and asking to continue their matter down the road uh, a good ways. You know, I mean, you know, historically the sort of tension has been, um, you know, a desire to, you know, not let the, you know, the backlog of criminal or civil matters, you know, uh, balloon up, you know, to try to resolve those matters as quickly as possible. But with that being said, um, I think, you know, more flexibility is probably necessary during this time frame. I'd say if you have a civil matter and it's not particularly time sensitive, uh, I'd say you're probably gonna, you know, face more flexibility from the court in terms of continuing the matters because there are still some civil matters that are time sensitive and that we're gonna to try to resolve. Um, there was a question about, um, you know, how exhibits are gonna be handled. Um, at this point, you know, we're not, you know, certainly, you know, as far as, as physical exhibits are concerned, 
uh, there's going to be sensitivity to, um, you know, if you will, social distancing in terms of that, or at least protective equipment in terms of that as far as use of gloves and those sorts of things. Um, I would certainly, if I was a, uh, if I was, you know, going to be presenting evidence at trial, I would be thinking about, you know, other sorts of ways to effectively present the evidence to the jury um, that that doesn't, you know, um, require, you know, you to get, you know, right close up, you know, to the jury. Uh, there are overhead projectors or, you know, other types of devices, I think, that can be used. But we did discuss this issue recently at a judge's meeting on, on uh, Monday, and just Carr was saying, well, you know, the exhibits are going to go back to the jury, just like they historically would. They're going to be provided with, you know, PPE, you know, uh, gloves and that sort of thing. So, they'll, you know, those exhibits will be back with the jury, you know, in the uh, deliberation room for their deliberations. But, but certainly, you know, I would think about, you know, other ways that you could perhaps, um, you know, present, you know, the evidence effectively to the jury. Great, thank you so much, Judge Fairgreave. Um, so Judge Osler has joined us. So, um, thank Hi you for, for joining us, Judge Osler. Um, we were just finishing up with Judge Fairgreave, so this is great time, lots of good questions. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate, I don't know where my, video is, but that's okay. I appreciate Judge Fairgrieve going first in his PowerPoint because it already kind of gave me an indication, here we go, I'll start my video, um, of what he talked about. Um, so I realized he did talk about uh, what's required in the courthouse and district court just basically joined in Superior Court's order as far as mask wearing. And I guess we had a premonition that the governor was going to come out with his new edict starting Friday anyway. So um, I think he probably went over that in detail. I just have a couple updates on the district court side. Um, so what we are asking and hoping for is that our attorneys are filing paperwork for change of pleas, deferred prosecution, and diversion. We're just asking that if those can get e-filed 24 hours in advance, that would be very helpful. Um, it's really hard when you email those the morning of to our JAs because they're super busy doing a lot of other things and it takes a bunch of steps just to get those in the file. Plus the judge can't sign them until they get in the file later. Um, so if we could get those e-filed um, as much as possible in advance, that would be great. As far as prosecutors, um, if you defense and prosecutors could work together on the pretrial offer, either attach it to the change of plea paperwork or make sure the prosecutor knows to e-file that, that would be great as well. Also, much like Superior Court, um, although we're not requiring people to appear live for change of pleas or entry of deferred prosecutions, we are asking that they're either on video or they appear live if they can't do the video feed. Just, um, I know that there was an email, I think that was sent out on behalf of Judge Fairgrieve on kind of the reasoning for that in Superior Court and that we have similar reasonings for um, wanting people to be identified when they're doing a change of plea or on deferred prosecution. We don't have to fingerprint them so we don't have the same issues that Superior Court faces, but. Any, any one of them that we can do on video or live. Um, and Judge Fairgrieve probably touched upon this as we're moving into phase three and phase four. Uh, district court isn't planning on throwing open our courthouse, courtroom doors, um, so to speak, uh, because we are limited, as long as there's social distancing requirements, you guys have been in our courtroom, so we are really limited in our size capacity we won't turn people away that want to appear in person um, and we're going to be streaming live fairly soon all of these hearings uh, for the public as well but i did want you to know that if someone has to come to court or wants to come to court they, they're allowed to do that certainly and we'll um, hear those cases live um, and that could be for the near foreseeable future because we really don't know how long we're going to be in these phases or how long they're going to require us to do social distancing. As far as jury trials, I think um, we're 
Judge Fairgrave covered it for Superior Court. And we're letting them get a head start so we can see how it all works. Uh, and they'll work out all the kinks for us. So district court isn't going to start our jury trials until um, September 1st, unless you have an individual in custody that needs to be heard sooner, then please contact the assigned department and we will try to set something up. Um, we're gonna be hearing our trials downtown. We won't be going to the fairgrounds. So we only have one courtroom in district court that conceivably could uh, fit a jury with social distancing and that's G2. So on Wednesday, Thursday, and Fridays, we'll continue to hold um, DV trials, one a day, um, down in G2 on those dates, just like we always have. All of the other departments that are non-DV are going to be doing their trials on Monday and Tuesdays. We will utilize G2 for one of the trials, and then Superior Court is graciously going to allow us to use one of their courtrooms if we have more than one trial going at a time. Um, so we should be able to accommodate those in September. Uh, let's see. Oh, the deferred prosecution order, I will either maybe uh, send out through Matt Kimball to get to you guys, but we didn't post that on our website just because it is a court order and we didn't want the general public just to be able to to download that um, but we do have a refillable form and i will have uh, email copy out to the defense attorneys um, so that you can have a copy of that so that when you prepare the deferred prosecution paperwork we'll do it for the prosecutors as well that you'll have that order and able to do that we did update our electronic home monitoring policy. I know a number of you have been contacting us that it was too restrictive and we did make it a little bit more restrictive than we had had in the past, but we modified it to allow for grocery shopping once a week, um, medical appointments, anything having to do with treatment, taking care of your ignition airlock device if that's an issue. Um, you should be able to mow your lawn. I think there were some questions about that. Church once one time per week. Recovery groups as allowed for by your treatment. So there's a number of exceptions um, that will just be standard. But if you have a special exception, you can bring it up to the judge at the time of sentencing or uh, bring it up with the PO and then they'll get it over to the judge to review. Um, at a later date for approval if there's something um, that isn't on one of those exceptions. And then we are doing motions to vacate ex parte as long as you send them to the prosecutor's office beforehand and they've had an opportunity to go through it and um, approve it. We are asking, and I think everybody's been really good about this, but having the attorneys appear by video, it just, um, makes it easier for us to do the breakout rooms and, and it's just easier to communicate and with your clients. I think that's it. Sorry, I'm like just frazzled because I've been doing a big docket, so I'm still really wired from that docket. So <laughs> I know I went through everything really quickly, but I don't know if there's any questions or anything on the district court side, but that's kind of our new updates. Mariah should um, contact the judge if there are any questions. Okay. So if anyone has any questions for either Judge Offer or Judge Perry, um, please feel free to use the chat function. And um, you can email or you can send a chat privately to Mariah or to myself, and we can get that, that question over to either judge. I'm not seeing any. There was one that just came up. Uh, okay, so in terms of Superior Court, <clears throat> um, as far as print challenges are concerned, so you should take a look at um, the Supreme Court's order um, and the information that I referred to there. So I think the short answer there is that there's a possibility, so in criminal cases, it's six parameters normally per party. Uh, there's a possibility of having three preemptory challenges if a party asks for it, basically, and if a court finds good cause for that. So 
So there's that, that possibility. Um, but at this point, the, the number of jurors we're bringing in is predicated on you know, the parties having six peremptory challenges, but there's a possibility of going down to three. Um, you know, there's a, a process that's, you know, I think described in the, uh, in the orders I referred to, but there's a possibility of going down to three. And I don't think that the Supreme Court affected the peremptory challenges for district court, it's still three, so. I do see a question that says, um, I may have already been answered, will the court be providing live streaming on their proceedings? And yes, we've been in the process of doing that and I hope it's going to be um, shortly. And then finally, uh, 3536 hearings, I assume are also on hold until at least September 1st. I'm, I can't say that's for sure. I'm gonna talk to our judges at our judges meeting um, on Thursday uh, to see if there are hearings that we can hold. Um, we might be able to hold some. I, I don't see why we can't uh, via Zoom. So I'll check with the judges and make sure they're, they're all on board with that. And if not, then it probably would just be on a department by department basis um, that contact your judge. On a DUI arraignment, is personal appearance required by both attorney and defendant? So you can appear via Zoom, but yes, you do still have to appear for a DUI arraignment. Can be live or by Zoom. Obviously, it works best if you're on the same medium, um, but we can make it work if we have to. In other words, if the attorney is appearing by Zoom, it would be great if the client could appear that way too, or if the attorney's appearing live and the client wants to appear live, we can handle it that way as well. I have had people coming in that have just been having um, difficulties with their internet connection or their Zoom connection. I had an attorney show up yesterday and I think her client was on Zoom, but we were able to handle it fine, but it's gonna happen. Right, so if there's not any additional questions, we'll go ahead and wrap that up. And we really appreciate both of your time this morning and um, look forward to another update. I'm sure there will be some additional information we'll need um, come July 6th um, as, we, as we figure out how we're gonna make it through. So um, thank you so much and thanks to everyone for joining us today. And if you have any additional questions, um, feel free to email. Um, either Lisa Darko or Mariah, and um, we can get that those questions over to the judges. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna be having more of these opportunities to hear from the courts. So thanks so much everyone and enjoy your Wednesday. Thank you.